welcome everybody. I want to begin by, by first of all, thanking our, our phenomenal presenters coming today on behalf of the Loyal Institute of Ministry and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Paul Jerzebowski. Um, I'm going to go first by introducing, um, you know, our, our title here today is Forming Community with Young Adults, What Can the Church Learn? And so we have some really dynamic speakers here with us today who are, are know quite a bit about um, what it takes to form community with young adults. And especially in light from Christus Vivut, uh, if I'm saying it right, because my Latin is always so terrible, but you can correct me. Um, we, have, uh, we have these these beautiful words from the Pope's most recent exhortation on young people, um, that Christ is alive and that Christ is alive in our communities. And we are gonna learn from some fabulous people today about just how community works. Uh, and, and so our first speaker, the structure we'll go for today, if it's all right with our audience and everybody else, we are gonna start with um, Julie and Stacy, and then we will take a break and let everybody that is participating in the webinar, you're all more than welcome. If you see the little chat bar in the bottom down there, as we're going, as everybody's presenting, don't hold your questions. I really invite you to type those down there. So between two of our speakers, we'll pause um, and have time for questions. So we'll read some questions to them. And then we will go to uh, Leah and Angie and then have time for questions in the end today. So feel free as you all keep going today in your chat bar, just keep writing to us. And and Paul and I are going to do, do some good work here to... Um, to field the questions as we go and, 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 and get your comments and questions in there. So I'd like to welcome Julie Meshek first today, if I pronounced it correctly. She is director of uh, global programs and networks for the Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact at 92nd Street Y. She oversees several of the Belfer Center's civic in in initiatives that bring the 92Y programs to new audiences and engage communities around the world. Then we have, st next up is Stacy Allen, and she's the chair of Young Adult Catholics of African, African Descent in the Diocese of Galveston, Houston. And she serves as a pastoral council chair for St. Monica Catholic Church, where she's been a member since 1994. And she's also the coordinator of youth ministry at her parish and is also a lecturer. Stacy is also part of the high school curriculum committee for the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. And she is also an attorney by trade and owns her own law firm in Houston, Texas. So welcome to the two of you. And then we have Leah Wojcicki. Oh, I did it wrong. Hang on. I'm going to try it one more time, Leah. <laughs> Wojciechowski. Was that better? All right. <laughs> Wojciechowski Ross. She is the president of the Detroit chapter of Young Catholic Professionals, a national apostolate that strives to help young professionals grow in their Catholic faith, build a national community, and answer a call to action as they work a witness for Christ in their workplaces and all their other aspects of their life. All right, let's all right. try this again. See, I'm trying to remember how to remember this. <laughs> I have to get uh, some yeah, of it. In high school, um, no one believed that my name was just Casey. Everyone thought it was like short for Cassandra or something. I'm not sure. Oh, I found it. Just, no, I'm just Casey. It's not Cassie. That could be like a show. There we go. <laughs> and then we have, and then finally we have Angie Thurston, who is creating spiritual formation experiences for the 21st century. She is dedicated connecting to connecting the inner life of spirit to the outer life of action for social change. Convinced that we need each other to become who we're meant to be, Angie supports an emerging field of leaders who are deepening community and combating our modern day crisis of isolation. She's also the director of formation of On Being Impact Lab, a ministry innovation fellow at Harvard Divinity School, and the co-author of How We Gather and Care of Souls, two reports profiling new forms of social and spiritual connection. And her work has also been featured in the New York Times and on NPR. And then we have the delightful co-host of mine, Paul Jerzembowski, who managed to log in as Tom Ryan again. <laughs> Not sure how that happened, um, but either way, that's Paul. So FYI, uh, his name is not Tom. Uh, he works for the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops as the Assistant Director for Youth and Young Adult Ministries in the Secretariat of Lady, Marriage, and Family Life and Youth. Paul also serves as the staff liaison for the USCCD National Advisory Young Adult Team on Young Team of the Young Adult Ministry, and is United States National Coordinator for World Youth Day as well. And I am Tracy Lamont, and I'll be your facilitator and moderator today. Um, I'm an assistant professor of religious education at the Loyal Institute for Ministry at Loyal, Loyola University here in New Orleans. And I'm also a member of the USCCB advisory team on young adult ministry. 
And so without further ado, with all of these fabulous introductions, I am going to turn it over to uh, Julie and Stacey are going to begin. Julie is going to begin by talking about the work that she's doing with Franklin Circles and her other work, and, and to sort of couch our conversation a little bit in, in the Pope's most recent exhortation on young people, Christ is Alive. Um, one of the quotes that I found that, that was quite perfect for today, um, he says in, in paragraph 230 about creating youth and young adult ministries, he says they should be broader and more flexible ones that go out to those places where real young people are active and foster the natural leadership qualities and the charism sown by the Holy Spirit. These are organizations and communities that try to avoid imposing obstacles, rules, controls, and obligatory structures on these young believers who are natural leaders in their neighborhoods and in other settings. And so, Julie, I will turn it over to you and, and welcome again and, and let us know what you're thinking about here in terms of forming community. Sure, well, um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Um, community is something I think about a lot in my work. And um, just as some quick background, I work for the 92nd Street Y, which is a community center uh, in New York City. So for more than 140 years, um, the actual building that I work in has been a place of community building. So we run programs uh, on any given day for any given audience, um, everyone from you know, senior citizens to newborns. Um, so people come from the Y from all different backgrounds, all different starting points, and with a myriad of interests. So they come to explore the arts, to come to some of our adult education, to experience civic dialogue, you know, to explore personal improvement. And I think, you know, in the work that we're doing, perhaps what's most important, no matter why you're coming, is that you are coming to connect with others, um, is sort of at the core of everything that we're doing. Um, so, you know, we have seniors that come and meet each other and then end up supporting each other in the community as they go out into the world. Or we have two people that show up and, you know, come to a pottery class and then end up teaching each other something new and, and doing a group show together. Um, so community looks, you know, very different, I think um, in all different ways, um, but really what we hope to be is sort of that point uh, that people can meet each other and form some of those connections. Uh, so I work in the Center for Innovation, our, our Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact. So all of my work is about kind of what take, what happens at the Y and taking the mission of the Y out into the world and giving people, no matter where they are, sort of the tools to create community and to form a community uh, as it looks like to them. So there's a lot of this rooted in the idea of co-ownership of our programs, of them, you know, just following up quickly on that great quote that we heard about flexibility and adaptability so that people can really feel um, that they are a community maker um, in their own lives. Uh, and so the Ben Franklin Circles, which I'm, I'm here to talk about today, is, is sort of a, a perfect example of that mission. Um, so to begin, what are the Ben Franklin Circles? Uh, this is a project that we took exactly um, from something that Franklin Ben Franklin wrote about in his autobiography. Uh, when he was a young man, Franklin set out to create a club that he called his Junto or his Mutual Improvement Club. And the idea was for Franklin to gather 12 people once a week. Uh, in his day, it was all men. It was all people that were craftsmen in the community. And it was 12 people that he hand selected. And they met as part of this Mutual Improvement Club at a, at a local pub every Friday night. And at sort of the core of this was the idea of asking questions about what it means to be a good person uh, and what it means to live a good life. Uh, Franklin began every day asking, what good can I do today? And at the end of the day, he would say, what good did I do this day? And so this club became a platform for them to explore those questions. Uh, the club met for 40 years, so they did all kinds of things. They you know, talked about the best book that they'd read and who they should share it with. They talked about who they should be championing, what young person they should be supporting. Um, but throughout all those years that it ran, um, Franklin kept coming back to these core 13 virtues. He had, as a young man at, at 19, wrote down this list, and this had become sort of his self-improvement plan. I like to think of it almost as sort of his guiding principles throughout his life, and you can actually see those 13 virtues listed here. Uh, so as part of his Junto and Mutual Improvement Club, one thing they did when they gathered would be to look at these virtues, and they would say, how are you doing with the practice of silence? 
what are you doing to make sure that we are living just lives? Uh, and so when we went back at the 92nd Street Y here, you know, over close to 300 years later and looked at this, we were, we were really sort of fascinated by this club as a model for how people could connect in the 21st century. So what we did was we um, actually looked at the 13 virtues and we thought, what if we created a discussion group and we did our own, you know, sort of mutual improvement club for today. We invited 12 people from the community and we said, for the next 13 months, we're going to meet once a month. And at each of these meetings, we're going to look at one of these virtues and use it as a window for conversation. So this was our pilot. We ran it from 2015 to 2016. And what we found was that, you know, these were sort of intriguing conversations topics. These were a way for people to kind of set some time out in their life to, to think about something sort of, you know, not necessarily a topic that you may be, you know, chatting with your coworkers about or at home with your kids chatting about. But it was sort of a special place where people could come together and, and talk about what they were dealing with in their own lives, you know, what their sort of aspirations were, um, what their own sort of self-improvement plans might look like. And so after that pilot, we decided that this was something that we would create a model of programming that we could put out into the world. Uh, so we took that very simple meeting structure that we had created, which was each meeting, uh, you would pick one of these topics. Franklin, and actually we can flip to the, to the next slide. Um, so there was a very sort of um, simple structure. Uh, Franklin provided for all 13 virtues, a very short definition. Uh, so we would begin the meeting and we would say, talk about this definition. We created a toolkit that included some sample questions. And at the end of the meeting, we um, sort of guided people to making a commitment for how they can live that virtue in their lives. So from a very simple toolkit, from a series of questions about how these virtues intersect with our day-to-day -day lives, with some sample commitments people could make. Uh, we put these tools out into the world and we um, basically offered them free of charge for anyone anywhere to, to start one of these circles. And then we provided some of the coaching for, you know, some advice for how to find people, you know, if you wanted to open it up to the public, how you could gather your members, uh, and then to take any of their feedback and any tools that they might need to, to make their individual group successful. Um, so to date, we have about 300 of these that have formed and they meet in living rooms, they meet in libraries, they meet in houses of worship, they meet even one that meets in a um, national park in Sedona, Arizona. Oh. Uh, and so we've really kind of doubled down on the idea that this can you know, pretty much happen anywhere. Um, anyone can lead one. You know, it's very similar to sort of starting a book group. And I think um, what's happened then is that, um, you know, we've allowed sort of the flexibility for a circle to look very different in one community for the next. But what connects all of them is the idea that these are small groups of people coming together to talk about the idea of, of civic virtue and virtue and what they those topics mean to our lives now. Um, so I've now been running this project since 2016. And I think, um, you know, we've seen a lot of things happen out of these circles. We've, you know, we've seen people better understand someone with a different viewpoint. We've seen people make new friends. Um, we've seen in some ways libraries or you know public institutions use these as a tool to bring people in for you know civic dialogue and to, to reinstate civility um, but I think kind of what's at the core of all of that is that this is a tool for you know building meaningful connections among individuals for for sort of strengthening civic bonds and community uh, mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit at the top I know there was mention of sort of the um, you know, the growing number of people that are dealing with issues around isolation and loneliness. Uh, you know, it's a huge problem now in America. One of the recent stats I, I read was that half of Americans report feeling lonely and that it's particularly prevalent among young people, that it's young people that are most likely to say that. Uh, so I think just generally looking at, at the structure of Ben Franklin Circles and how we put it out in the world, you know, our hope to counteract that is to simply provide people with regular face-to-face -face gatherings. So that's sort of the first step for when you're building a community. Um, 
I also think what's what I've learned is sort of the success of this project is the emphasis on these bigger topics, these value based conversations. So people are showing up and they're using these as a window to to make connections with other people, to tell stories from their own experience, to to build some of that trust that's that's key to um, you know, creating a cohesive community and keep people coming back. Uh, and then also, I think it's interesting, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like what bonds people. And I, um, you know, read recently that, you know, you bond with people that you work on something with. So you bond with your coworkers because you've done a project together or, you know, you bond with your teammates if you play a sport because you've done this, this together, you've played this game together. Um, and so I think with the circles, what's sort of interesting to me is, is this piece of, um, people committing to how they're going to make a change in their life or committing to something they're going to do in their community. You know, often people will say, as a result of this conversation, I'm going to find a cause to give to, or I'm going to volunteer, or, you know, one of the virtues is silence. I'm simply going to commit to being a better listener to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when you come back to the next month and check in with the members of your circle, uh, mm -hmm. you're getting that support. You're all kind of working on this project of, of self-improvement together. I mean, Franklin called it a mutual improvement club. So so that's the project is, is sort of working together to do uh, good in the world, in your own life, and, and also for the community. Um, and then finally, just a, a couple things that I think um, works well, since we are talking about young people with the project. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that Franklin was 19 when he made his list of, of these virtues. And I think it's interesting for young people to sort of use this as a tool to kind of encourage them to think about you know, what is my sort of mutual, what is my kind of self-improvement plan? What are the 13 virtues that define my life? What are the values that I want to live as, you know, sort of a forward-looking project as you're thinking about what's to come? Um, and then also that these are very open-ended conversation. They are very much based on sort of the people in the room, owning them, having that flexibility. Uh, and also that it is a leadership opportunity. We do have teens around the country and young people that actually are the hosts of these groups. So they are the convener. In certain cases, it is an administrator or someone in the community that's an adult that's convening these. But we also have um, students from high schools around the country that have contacted us and said, I want to be the one in my school to run one of these. Or in one case in New York City, we actually have a student that um, worked with the administrators of her school uh, to reach out to a group of students at other high schools. And now she's the convener. Um, and it's, it's kind of a multi-school project, which was really exciting to see. Um, so just to wrap up quickly, our, you know, these tools um, that are available, here's a little bit of, of press that we've we've gotten uh, around the project. Um, but the one thing I, I really emphasize whenever I talk about this is that um, these are projects that it's a grassroots movement. I mean, what we're hoping to do is sort of put this model out into the world. And then my role is to support the people that are interested in, in seeing what this looks like in their community. Um, so I would just encourage you, if you're interested, to, to visit our website, which is benfranklincircles.org. Uh, where you can download the toolkits, you can join our Facebook group for hosts, you can take all of the sample guides, you know, the original writings, uh, and, you know, and then reach out to me. And I am <laughs> then in the role of, of helping sort of form these and, and helping sort of shape what the best way to uh, um, basically initiate this in the community looks like. That's wonderful, Julie. Really, really wonderful. I love these quotes and I can't, I mean, I can't get over them. Back on, on the, uh, the other page. I was drawn by the opportunity to create dialogue about value rather than ideology. I feel like young people are are really like just yearning for that in our in our faith communities and in all of our communities today. So, yeah, you brought it, and I and I love the way that you talked about you know originally Ben Franklin he hand selected, and that's something we talk about in ministry all the time is that personal invitation is yes. hand selected. You know, it's not just kind of an all call everybody come. You have to know you're wanted. You you know. Yes wanted to be there yeah thank you so much julie stacy oh, we're gonna thank you. yes hello thank you so much for this opportunity to be a part of this webinar and to talk about um the young adult catholics of african descent here in the archdiocese of galveston houston um primarily in the uh, houston metro area so in order to understand the organization as it stands today i think it's important to talk a little bit about how we even got started. So back in 2015, there was an invitation from the USCCB. Uh, they were hosting a um, listening session for Black 
Catholic uh, young adults. And I received the information, I applied, and somehow I got accepted. So that was great. And it was about 10 to 15 of us um, who were there in uh, a retreat center just outside of Baltimore and were there for three to four days. And it was a really unique and powerful experience to meet other very young young adults who, who were black and active within their Catholic faith and their parishes, but to also have this space where we could um, really unearth some of the issues and the challenges, some of the blessings as well that we were experiencing without our different throughout our different parishes and dioceses throughout the United States. And so after leaving that experience, I just started to think about um, a lot of the things that we shared and one of the things that that was kind of that I noticed anyway is that we were doing really great work and but kind of operating in silos in different areas and sometimes felt alone in some of the challenges that we were meeting in the diocese, especially as young adults who were moving into different areas and then being thrown into situations that we weren't familiar with, whether that was dealing with a, a priest at our parish who wasn't supportive or archdiocese as a whole that didn't value communities or colors or seemingly didn't value communities of color. Um, I thought about the need to connect beyond uh, just our particular parish. This is also happening in the backdrop of where my own parish, where our young adult group, that was at one point fairly active. And although we were active so individually in the parish, we weren't active together, but I felt this strong need for there to be a gathering space specifically for young adults. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that young adults, um, what I experienced oftentimes and what I heard from other people were that the space that a lot of us had from a very young age seemed to be seemingly silent at the time that we needed it the most. This time where being a young adult is often a time of flux and change and constant um, self-evolution. And so coming back to the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, I just remember praying about my experience and um, I think just guided by the Holy Spirit just kind of had this idea about what, what about creating throughout the Archdiocese space for Black Catholic young adults to be able to gather and talk about our unique experiences, um, not only being Catholic, but specifically being Black young adult Catholics. And so I started to talk to people um, and just to see if this was just a, an idea that was only beneficial for me, but if other people had the same kind of yearning. And as I had what I thought would be, you know, quick conversations and feelers, they turned into 15, sometimes 20, 30 minute conversations where people were enthusiastic and saying, oh my gosh, yes, I feel the same kind of way. There's nothing going on in my parish or we're really right. active don't feel connected with other people. And then so I started to try to see, okay, how feasible is this? Do I, do I have support? And I suppose first spoke to um, the deacon who was uh, housed at the Texas Southern University Catholic Human Center, Texas Southern University being a historically black college and university. He was on board. He was also a member of my parish. So I wasn't sure how much further that would go. And so he contacted, connected me with the vicar for um, the vicariate of African descent for the archdiocese who then spoke to our cardinal about it and everyone was supportive and on board. So then it was about kind of going through the process that Julie talked about with Ben Franklin about connecting with a select few, started talking to priests and trying to get them to identify very active uh, black young adult Catholics at their parishes. And so it was about a group of 10 of us that kind of started as this host committee, if you will, trying to figure out like, what does this look like? What does this feel like? And our that was in October of 2016. And then by um, June of 2017, we had our first event, our launch event, and it's called, and that's our staple signature event that brings out a pretty good crowd. It's called a Juneteenth brunch. For those who don't know what Juneteenth is, um, mm -hmm. it was uh, it commemorates June 19th of 1865 when Robert E. Lee rode down to um, Galveston, Texas and announced to the enslaved, enslaved people there that they were in fact emancipated. And mind you, this is about two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And so we used that time and that unique history to then gather folks for a brunch where we have um, very Southern cuisine, build your own grit station and chicken and waffles and all those things, but also used it as a time to truly build community. Um, we had a speed networking um, time where there were questions on each table and people talk about travel to, um, you know, hindrances to their Catholic faith. So people can just kind of group and gather that way. And so the vision and uh, the mission for 
the young adult Catholics of African descent is, is about fourfold. So the first thing is to build community, right? So create a sense of community and build a spirituality of communion among young adult Catholics of African descent. And I also want to note that there, we are particularly um, in tune to using the term African descent because we want to make sure that um, that's just something that's uh, tailored to those who are considered African-American, those who were born in the United States, but the entire African diaspora myself, I'm Afro-Latina, I'm from Panama originally, right? So I don't, I'm not necessarily African-American, but there's in Houston, which has been named the most diverse city in the United States, there are a large Cameroonian community and large Nigerian community and people from all over the diaspora. So we wanted to make sure that we were inclusive in our name. Um, the other thing that we talk about is spirituality. So providing resources and programming to cultivate, enhance and edify each member's Catholic identity and to empower them to discern God's call and to share their faith. So we were really thinking about um, supporting those who may be considering vocations, whether that's a vocation to marriage or the diaconate or mm -hmm. even the priesthood and making sure that in our programming, we include clergy uh, to expose us, right? And to make human those who have answered the call to, to holy orders. And so one of the things we had was a um, Faith is Bay, a relationship series where we focus on all dynamics of relationships, uh, those who may be single, those who were, who were raising families, and we brought in different deacons of African descent uh, to help us cultivate those um, intimate sessions where we can just really talk about the issues we were facing um, as young adults. We also care about building leadership. So one of the things is a, a lot of churches within the African American apostolate, they do not necessarily have as many resources for staff in different positions. And it wasn't until I later on as a young adult that I even discovered like there were actual positions within the archdiocese where you can be paid to do things because a lot of our folks in our church, including me doing youth ministry of my church are unpaid positions. So um, trying to expose people to the fact that you can use your passion and your call and the gifts that you have to actually actively church uh, serve your faith. So uh, cultivating opportunities for training and support in leadership positions for those who are laid or in lay ordained and consecrated religious um, leadership roles, and then also civic engagement, of course. Um, so just providing members for uh, opportunities for our members to live out their faith through community engagement. So one of the things that we recently participated in this year was a black hair care product drive and, and a dinner for a homeless teen shelter. So um, one of the things is like people always donate different things at shelters, including, you know, hygienic products, but they aren't necessarily tailored for communities of color. So we, uh, through our different churches within the Black Apostolate, collected items, and then we went and served dinner to teens at a homeless shelter, and that was a great um, opportunity that we had. So the way that we try to co cultivate community, which is the focus of today's talk, is just to create opportunities um, no matter what parish that you go to, to come together where you can fully be your full self. Um, Servant of God, Thea Bowman, whose cause for canonization is up mm. right now when she addressed the USCCB, she addressed all of these bishops, um, talked specifically about the importance of, of people of African descent to be able to show up to their parishes and different Catholic events as a full human being and to recognize that that looks different within communities of color. Oftentimes we may clap in churches that don't ordinarily clap. We may shout and say amen and hallelujah. So we try to create a sacred space through our organization where people can bring their authentic self, whatever that means, so, and paint in the brightest and boldest colors that God created you to do anyway. Um, so, and another thing we try to do is also to support um, programming at the two historically black colleges and universities that surround the Houston metro area. One is Texas Southern University, which I mentioned before, which I'm actually at their center uh, using their space. And also um, there was a Newman Center at the Prairie View A&M University that no longer exists, but there are Catholic um, students there who are not necessarily being served. So we use the um, rivalry that both of the schools have to have tailgates and so forth, and then hand out resources and information so that oh. Catholic students there know that there is an overarching group that's there to serve them. And so um, the director right now, Doris Barrow at the TSU Newman Center, is really working hard to work with Prairie View A&M students 
to create a sense of community there, even though they don't have a center, you might be able to find other resources in the area so that they can gather and meet and continue to cultivate their Catholic identity, even though they are in school and not necessarily as accessible to the Houston area and the many Catholic churches that we have here. Um, so that is how uh, our organization seeks to create community and to answer the call and to be different and diverse in, the, in our approach. We don't do a whole lot of meetings and constantly meeting. We try to make sure that when we do meet, it's um, we also create um, space and time specifically just to uh, debrief and to share our joys and our frustrations in ministry. I know a recent study came out and showed that even though the African-American or African descent community within the Catholic faith may not represent a large percentage within our faith um, anymore, we are some of the most active groups of people within any church. So we try to make sure that there's opportunities to where the um, these young adults who tend to be very active can be re-edified and re-energized to continue to do the work that God has called them to do. That's amazing, Stacy. I, I loved it. And I'm, I'm already seeing, and I'm sure we'll see with all four of our presenters, but there's already such an overlapping theme of providing space that's that's not structured necessarily, you know, providing space where you can be yourself, you know, for, for Julie, it was, it's about the virtues and, and for Stacy, it's, it's so very much about being your authentic self, which is in and of itself, a virtue, you know, and, and just being able to have a space where, you know, that you are recognized for the beauty of who you are and the gifts that you have, you know, and, and I think a lot of times in ministry, you know, we always think about programs or, you know, what opportunities do we have to share the faith? But what about the faith sharing that occurs naturally just by gathering people together, you know? And, and so there's such a power to that. You know, I, I was actually, and I won't go on, but I was having a discussion with somebody this morning, you know, about, you know, the teachers in the area, the Catholic school teachers in the area that just want to get together, not for professional development, but to just get together, <laughs> you know? And, and so to provide the space for that. And that's really what it is, you know, is providing that space. So that was really beautiful, Stacy. really, really beautiful. Um, so I'm going to open it up to to our audience here. We'll we'll take a a quick pause for presenting um, and and see what questions that you all have. So feel free to type in the chat bar on the bottom there with any questions that you have. I have to scroll around here. So so anyone that wants to chime in, we have Michael Horace. I think is the first one who had a question. Let me scroll around here. Um, and he asked, and this could be, you know, to, to Julie and possibly Stacy as well. I think he's, I think he, he typed it while Julie was talking, but regardless, um, can you talk more about the convener role? Is that volunteer? Is someone trained and appointed? Do they rotate through the 13 meetings? Um, so that was Michael's question. I think it's for you, Julie. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. No, thank you, Michael. Um, this is a volunteer role. Uh, it's open to whoever would like to to um, assume that role, basically. I mean, essentially how it works is um, you begin by contacting us. Well, two things. One is all of these resources are, are free. So often people go to our site, take them, and then I later through, you know, the magic of Google <laughs> or Facebook or Meetup, see that people have formed these. And then I reach out and say, would you like to be part of our community of people that are running circles um, so that you can get a little bit more support? And sometimes people say, oh, great, thank you. And then, you know, we kind of give them resources, you know, kind of ongoing support to the degree that they want it or need it or seek it out. Um, so there's kind of two tracks. You can take the tools, form one and, and sort of be out in the world, or you can actually reach out and we do have a series of training videos. Um, we have a monthly uh, call for everybody that's an active host. We have a Facebook group um, that is open to everybody that's in that leadership role for their particular circle. And then, you know, you have a little bit more back and forth with myself and my program manager who runs the project with me. Um, but it is a role, you know, we call those our, our circle hosts. Um, in some cases, there can be multiple for one circle. I do know that there are people that you, part of your question is about rotating the role. There are are some that different people assume that role for the meeting once the group is comfortable with each other uh, and in some cases it can begin as one person is sort of the convener and this was the case with one of the groups that I helped start in New York where you know there was one person that filled the role of sort of scheduling the meetings every month and then there was another person that just sort of had that ability to direct the conversation a little bit so they kind of played that role one person took notes so it can be sort of distributed around every role um, but you know the idea is that 
there's sort of a point person that, that corresponds with us that we can share ongoing resources and be available to answer questions. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. Oh, and Michael added your link. That's Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Stacy, real quick, I have a question, Stacy. When you were, you know, you were, the whole journey of how you're identifying the needs of, of you know, everybody in your community, what what obstacles there could have been a bunch but like what challenges did you have to overcome you know i heard you talking about um reaching out to the pastors and things like that and and i'm thinking about the ministry professionals i know that you know in trying to form young adult groups they, they just have a lot of obstacles that they face and i wonder if you had faced any in doing this and, and how you kind of overcame them right so um you know, like you mentioned, some of the obstacles. So it's interesting because this ends up being, you know, one of the hopes of the group is that by becoming a member of YACAD, and just call it that for short, and um, organizing and coming together in that group, then people are encouraged to then go back to their parishes and try to gather there as well. And so we constantly hear back about sometimes that, you know, pastors just don't get it. They don't think young adults really need to do anything. They don't necessarily provide funding or anything like that. And so some of those similar things are some of the things that we faced as well. Um, so we have a vicar for uh, the apostolate of African descent within our archdiocese, but unlike some other um, cultural groups within our archdiocese, we don't have an office and mm -hmm. there is challenges with funding. So one of our biggest hurdles is just making sure that we can get funding. And so the TSU Newman Center has been so gracious a lot of time to include us within their programming and we collaborate anyway so they help us to get funding but that's you know one of the challenges we have a new vicar coming in now is just to make sure okay are we a line item do we have, have an ability to put on but on events and pay speakers when we bring them in um, a lot of our um, deacons within our archdiocese have been gracious enough to where we just give them like a little love offering and some of us who are professionals will kind of pull together and and by gift you know gift cards as a love offering or something like that so that you know that's one thing I think also, you know, sometimes when there are archdiocesan offices that focus on young adult um, fostering those things, sometimes not feeling as supported. We have some new leadership in that area, so we're so grateful. Um, I got to meet with, I don't know, she's on the call, but Angie, she was so great um, from the archdiocese office. Um, so making sure that we have buy-in at all levels as we continue to try to figure this out. We're a fairly young organization, so we're still trying to get our sea legs or land legs, whatever it's called, and <laughs> um, so we can figure it out. But a lot of it is just funding and then making sure that we have buy-in at all levels so people understand that um, it's important that all communities continue yeah. to um, be seen and to be heard, and specifically with the and within the African African American and African apostolate, we have such a rich history within our Catholic faith, and so we're just demanding to continue to have space where we have earned it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You said that very well, very well. Thank you so much, Stacey. Yeah, I was very curious about you know because we hear so often people doing starting up ministries like you have, and and just just to encourage them to keep going, you know, because it's very easy to take on obstacles that, that, that just push you back, but you know you have the power of the spirit on your side because look at how many young adults are gathering around in community just by virtue of offering them the space and, and identifying who they are, you know? Yeah, that was beautiful. We have one question for, um, let me scroll back up. I think Barbara McCrabb's got a question for Stacy, and she said, how do you identify potential participants and how do you invite them? So we use a lot, well, we try to use social media and we also rely a lot on word of mouth. So uh, there is a listserv where our information goes out to um, a priest um, within the apostolate, um, those churches that have a history of catering to those of African descent, but also beyond that. So we have priests and deacons who are really on board and make sure that they share with their young adults. We also have priests who I'm sure are bogged down with tons of emails and so aren't necessarily disseminating that information. Um, so we rely a lot also on having um, ambassadors, if you will, from our organizations at the various pages. So I will work with the archdiocese to get all the flyers printed and then say, OK, you know the rules on the ground within your parish, which are how your priest likes things set up, what, what's the the bulletin board to place it on or how many days in advance you have to tell the secretary and all of the rules that are very different. <laughs> and so we say, you know the rules 
or you know who to talk to about the rules, here's however many flyers. And on top of that, make a commitment to text at least 10 of the young adults about our event coming up. And then we um, are, try to disseminate as much information via uh, social media. So we're on Instagram, Twitter, and mm -hmm. Facebook. Thank God for apps that allow you to post to all three at the same time. And mm -hmm. then we also have a listserv that we send out information to. So we really mm -hmm. rely a lot on our church ambassadors. And so yeah. initially identifying them was a little difficult, but that's where um, being active within the church helped me out a lot and also various people because they may, they knew other, even if they weren't young adults, they knew adult contacts who were active in their church who then could identify active young adults who then have the pulse in the ear of their colleagues within their church. So that's, we kind of um, rely a lot on kind of what I call old school word of mouth. I don't think there's anything that replaces right. it in, in relationships. There's no substitute post something 17 billion times if you don't have relationships with people within the actual churches it's probably not going to give you the best term right. right and that's a reoccurring theme we've already heard today yeah it's got to be that personal relationship you have to know the people you know yeah because and, and because otherwise you're just another part of of networking and social media you know and there's so much of that so if you don't have that personal connection, yeah, very wonderful. Thank you, Stacy. I would like, to, and Julie's got a little uh, note she put down there that you can email um, the Ben Franklin Circles directly, and she put the Gmail information so for everybody to look down there. And Barbara says, thank you, I agree, relationships are key. <laughs> um, so we're gonna transition here, and we are gonna move over to Leah, who's gonna talk about young Catholic professionals. So Leah, if you wanna put your camera on, and then we'll put on Leah and Angie's camera and microphones, and then we will switch here. Uh, and, and so we'll start with Leah, and then we'll, we'll go to Angie. All right, thank you. Hi, well, for all who are out there, I would, I would like to start by having you think about the activities and the people that you find yourself coming back to over and over again. What activities are there? What relationships are there that you keep going back to them? I'm sure we can, think of a lot of examples in our own lives so obviously we need to have some kind of community with those people and it and with those activities in order to keep going back so i think that's the whole point of community is that there needs to be something regular about it there needs to be some kind of relationship building environment over time with like-minded people and it's very engaging for whatever reason whatever the community may be but the point is it happens over time it's reoccurring so I would like to today to talk about Young Catholic Professionals, the organization that I'm part of. I'm the president of the Detroit chapter and kind of how we form community and how we really focus on both dynamic orthodoxy and the charisms or spiritual gifts within YCP. So those are my three points for today, which you can see on your screen. So first of all, what is Young Catholic Professionals? I think some of you may have heard of YCP because it is a national apostolate. We currently have 19 chapters across the country, soon to be 20, as our chapter in Los Angeles is launching soon. Our Detroit chapter launched almost two years ago, so and I've been on since the founding of the team. So I've really learned a lot, grown a lot throughout this whole process. So YCP has a threefold mission. The first is to form our Catholic identity. The second is to build Catholic community. And the third is to inspire, and not just inspire, but actually answer our call to action, which looks different for all of us. And we really focus on the professional aspect of our lives. So our, our theme or our motto is working in witness for Christ. So of course, most of us spend a, a great majority of our time during the day working. And for most of the, us, we work in secular environments. And so how can we still live our faith and witness to our values and to our morals at work? So that's why we really come together to inspire each other, to hear executive speakers and learn from our executive mentors about how we can grow professionally and also personally and spiritually. So we can combine all of those aspects of the human person. We have 22 events a year. And of course, as I mentioned, that's a very regular opportunity for people to come together. So if there's one or two events happening every single month, people can keep coming back and they can keep engaging with the same people over time and build relationships with people over time. So I think that a lot of the community part happens very organically. 
So I love this concept of dynamic orthodoxy. I actually stole the term from an article I read uh, about a Catholic megachurch, they called it, called St. Anne in Koppel, Texas, which is near Dallas. I had never heard of the little town. I'm from up north. But um, I came across this article and it, it had this phrase dynamic orthodoxy, which I really loved because you know, sometimes people think of dynamic and orthodox as kind of opposites. And I think that's a big problem uh, when it comes to building community with young adults and in our church in general. So we really need to think of them together. So dynamic orthodoxy, I think, kind of gives us the, the vision or the, the big picture, the why we do what we do. It's kind of in the attitude behind how we do what we do, which I'll get to with the charisms and spiritual gifts. So um, the Pope in, in the same letter that Tracy referenced before actually referenced some youth activities or young adult activities as sometimes being dull, meaningless, and unattractive. So I think those are pretty provocative words, but since the yeah. Holy Father used them, I feel okay using them myself. So I think yeah. people are really tired of dull, meaningless, and unattractive church activities or church yeah. ministries. Of course, they're not all like that, but I think too often the activities in our parishes are a little too rote or predictable, or they're not really geared toward today's audiences in the way that they could be. They, the, those activities can almost start to feel like just things to do. So sometimes our most active parishes with the most ministries and the most activities going on, they just do a lot of things. So, I mean, it's not bad to do those things, but are people really getting meaning and growth out of those activities is the question. So first of all, dynamic. If we look at our faith, we know that our faith is dynamic. It's beautiful, it's exciting. And our church activities and ministries, instead of you know, being dull, meaningless, and unattractive, what's the opposite of all that? Well, vibrant, meaningful, attractive. So how can we really build an attitude characterized by those uh, attributes in our leaders in the church and in our leaders in our young adult communities and of course in the followers too, it kind of rubs off. So people want to feel engaged. They wanna be part of authentic community. They wanna feel that sense of forward movement and growth and vibrancy and really feel the depth and the richness of the faith, which it is, it is dynamic. And then of course, our faith is also orthodox. And it, you know, the truth is also beautiful and exciting. And I think sometimes there is a, a little bit of a temptation or a fear uh, that people will think that we're being controversial or we're not really connecting with people or people don't wanna hear that anymore, but we should never water down the truth. You know, the Holy Father, um, Pope John Paul II and Jesus himself so many times says, be not afraid. So let's be not afraid. Let's trust that God actually, in fact, did create us to seek truth and to desire truth. He didn't want us to have some watered down version. He wants to give us the full truth. And the truth really attracts the human soul much more than any kind of watered down, less controversial version. So that's dynamic and orthodoxy. So within young Catholic professionals, we strive for that kind of vision and that kind of attitude within our leaders. And of course we try to pass that on then to all of our attendees. So second, we have charisms or spiritual gifts in our church communities. So as Tracy mentioned, uh, when she read the Pope's quote, she did mention those charisms. So I think of the charisms as kind of the process or the how we kind of implement our vision, which is the dynamic orthodoxy that we're trying to create. So um, there's a workshop called Called and Gifted, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. And I became familiar with this workshop within the last couple of years. And it's more or less a workshop and an inventory to help discover your spiritual gifts and your charisms. And a main thing that I've learned through it is that when people start doing what they're called to do and what they're gifted in doing, they invest incredible time and effort and energy. And through YCP, most of us are volunteers. All of the leadership teams in the 19 chapters, soon to be 20, are volunteers. And it's just completely amazing to see how much time people are investing, even though they're volunteers. And people often ask us, oh, do you do YCP full time? 
as if they think it's a full-time job and that's kind of what it looks like sometimes but in fact we're volunteers so why is it that we're willing to do amazing things and invest our time and energy well we found that when we help identify what people's charisms or spiritual gifts are then we can really plug people into what they're gifted in and what they're called in people really come alive as leaders when they use their gifts they tend to be more energetic they tend to have more effective results and they tend to be really skilled in those areas so and to qualify when i say people come alive as leaders that doesn't look the same for everybody so you know i think leadership is a scary word for some people sometimes but you know we can be leaders in any small or big way it doesn't mean necessarily standing in front of you know a group of people talking it could mean anything so there are 24 spiritual gifts that were identified in the through this workshop in this inventory and i want to share just a couple examples to kind of see what that might look like in community if you're really finding people with these gifts so first key example i think is the charism of hospitality so people with the spiritual gift of hospitality come alive and they just love to be warm and welcoming they love to you know gather especially the new people or the people who might not quite fit the mold of most of the people who are in the community so of course when it comes to catholic young adult community sometimes we have newcomers or sometimes we have people who are not so strong in their faith and maybe they feel a little isolated in a way so people with hospitality can be very welcoming and that can make all the difference to a newcomer Another charism that I think is really important to focus on is evangelism. So Jesus himself, of course, proclaimed the truth with both affection and power, which I think is another really you know, powerful dichotomy to think about the affection and the love that he shared, but also the power. He didn't water it down. He didn't, you know, he wasn't afraid to speak up. So both affection and power. So people with the spiritual gift of evangelism do the same they love to talk about their faith share their stories and ask other people for their stories and they're very authentic in that and they don't approach people as a project to convert but rather you know a person to really get to know and of course we feel more inspired when we hear somebody tell a story with that much passion and authenticity um, another one is service so people with a spiritual gift of service like to take action. So the more kind of practical side of things, they see a practical need and they jump to meet that need. So these are just a few examples of how we can kind of help identify people's gifts and plug them into roles where they'll be really effective and help build the community as leaders in whatever way that, that leadership might look like. And uh, to close for the moment, I was reading recently, about the so-called purpose-driven economy so i've heard it said many times now that we are currently living in a more purpose-driven economy more and more this generation this generation of leaders and workers want to feel purpose and meaning and impact in the work that we do or the relationships that we have we want to build those relationships we want to grow as people we want to focus on the process and you know, that's what drives us. So whether it's in work or in volunteerism or anything, we're driven by that purpose. So we really, you know, the charisms can help us really plug into what people's personal purpose and motivation are. Yeah, that was beautiful, Leah. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really well done. Thank you so much. You know, it's that, it, I, one of our, we have one of our speakers or uh, audience, uh, participants who wrote in, you know, the quote, you know, dull, meaningless, and unattractive, like, oh, that's hard to hear. And, but it's what we're hearing from many, many young people as to why they're, you know, they're, that's been their experience sometimes of, of life in ministries and parishes. And then there are some that are just on fire. You know, there are some that are really doing the, the excellent work, you know, especially in Take Stacy's work as well with parishes, you know, and so, so, but it is, you know, it's interesting the Pope wrote that, <laughs> you know, he didn't pull any punches on that one. Um, but, you know, so I, so I really appreciated how you, how you honed in on, on the different gifts. Um, again, I had a, a really, wonderful meeting with a few folks this morning and, and we mentioned the same thing not everybody's gifted in all things not everybody has strengths in all things and to and sometimes people feel overwhelmed by that they feel you know i think 
some some folks can be negative by nature. I know I can. I kind of look at, you know, like five great things happen and one wasn't great. And I think to myself, oh, the one the one bad thing, you know, and that's what I focus on sometimes, sadly. And I, I try to work on that. But so when, when it comes to strengths, sometimes we focus on what we're not good at and we we don't let our actual gifts and charisms flourish as a result. So I, I think that was really beautiful, Leah. I love how your organization really focuses on developing the gifts that people were given, you know, by, by God. Yeah, that was, that was beautiful, Leah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Angie, I'm happy to, to turn it over to you. I definitely want to encourage everybody. Um, we're probably going to go a little bit over time today, and, and that's just because we have amazing speakers, and I also want time in the end for closing remarks and closing reflections from everybody. So everybody, feel free to keep writing in the chat bar, and when we pause after Angie, we'll, we'll go back and read them, but don't hold your questions. Just write them in there. And remember, it's recorded, so if you have to you know, sign off, if you have a meeting at 2 or whatever you got going on, um, I will send the link out to everybody who registered, and then it'll be on the US. CCD's website. Um, so Angie, without further ado, please welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you also. Uh, it's been such a treat to hear from you, Julie and Stacy and Leah. Um, and I've learned a great deal already from being here on the call. So I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll just begin by sharing a word about myself as I come to this conversation. Uh, so I am the child of an interfaith marriage, and perhaps more importantly, the child of two dedicated spiritual seekers who met in San Francisco in the late 1970s. Uh, they raised me and my siblings uh, around the teachings of a text called the Urantia book that most have not heard of. But the thing to know for this conversation is just that the central tenets of that text have to do with developing a closer relationship with God and following more closely the inspiration of the life and teachings of Jesus. So that's relevant for this conversation because I kind of grew up knowing, even before a lot of the language emerged, that it was possible to be deeply religiously motivated as I was and am, while also being unaffiliated religiously, which I also was and am. <laughs> so uh, I come to this conversation as one of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, but also someone who is um, in many ways quite devout in my religious life. And that is really the, the orientation that I bring to this conversation about young adults and community. And so just a word about the work that that has led me into and its relevance to this conversation. Uh, after, after seeking spiritual community myself, I, I finally ended up at Harvard Divinity School as a student, really wondering at this time of so much religious transition, how I might be of service in helping to deepen spiritual community. And that tradition, that, that, um, especially falling along the lines of the trends of disaffiliation, the rise of the spiritual but not religious, but not only looking at those uh, who were outside of religious traditions, but also with a real, a real curiosity about how folks who do maintain a religious identity and community are also drawing from streams outside of that one tradition in, in pulling together what might constitute their spiritual life. And one of the things that's been a theme uh, that was already brought up on this webinar today is our crisis of isolation. Mm -hmm. So I had a particular heart for this question as it relates to, okay, if we're cobbling together our spiritual lives, how are we then finding ourselves in deep community? Uh, and how are we growing into the people that we're called to be? And so that really led me to uh, look at a landscape, a wide landscape of where young people especially were finding meaningful experiences of belonging. And this at first was very distinctly within a secular landscape. I was looking at innovative communities in fitness and the arts and justice movements and maker spaces and gaming communities and asking, you know, what is, what is the motivation for fostering this community and what are people finding here? And it was remarkable just to note the themes that emerged consistently across such a wide array of different kinds of communities. And it basically came down to six key themes. Uh, the first was about personal transformation and right up next to that was social change. So that, ha and we heard that from, from Julie already, right? How we're working together toward a personal goal, but then there's a sense of a shared commitment. So those, those twin ideas. Uh, activating creativity was a big one, as was purpose finding, mentioned purpose. And then accountability to the person we want to become or feel called to become. And 
on top of or surrounding all of that was this commitment to fostering community and community with a real depth to it. You know, I think I've become a bit protective of the word. You know, back in the environmental movement, the heyday of that, there was greenwashing, which was, oh, suddenly everything's labeled green. And yeah. I feel like um, to some extent, because of the, the stakes of our crisis of isolation, we, we have a bit of community washing now <laughs> uh, where we label things as community, whether or not we actually uh, feel what I would describe as uh, the experience of being deeply known and deeply loved, right? That we not only know about the experiences of our kin, but we're also committed enough to them and love them enough that we are showing up in the highs and lows of their lives and they in ours. So with that being said, I want to spend the bulk of the time that I uh, have here today to actually talk about a pilot project that this work has led to. So basically the arc of it has been getting to know all these amazing community leaders across the secular landscape, then getting to know about amazing community leaders who are innovating within religious traditions, um, whether that's dinner churches or pop-up Shabbat or Muslim small groups or online Buddhist sanghas, uh, and beginning to bring together and gather the leaders of these various communities. and. And, and then in the midst of that, beginning to cultivate relationships with leaders of religious institutions who are coming forward and, and wanting to understand better um, how to serve millennials and how to serve those younger than millennials in, this, in, in the United States especially. And for myself as an unaffiliated millennial, then having the extraordinary gift of coming to know and experience much more of, of the of, of what is held within our extraordinary traditions that have been built over centuries and to begin to ask how might we actually build these bridges between ancient wisdom and the innovation that's emerging now and so one of the one of the core pilot initiatives we've been engaged in which tracy mentioned is a project called the formation project and this has been advised by a group of women religious amongst others but um some sisters, uh, both Sisters of St. Joseph and Sisters of Mercy have been helping to advise this pilot, which really builds upon, in many ways, the Novitiate experience in asking um, how, how do we become the, the people we are called to be and how, how do we foster community around that journey and how do we then be of service through that community to the world. And we have two design challenges with this pilot. The first is that the folks we're trying to serve are coming from all walks of life religiously and in some cases uh, don't even have a, a clear religious identity or community to which they belong. So that, that phenomenon of not being able to rely upon shared language or shared practice or shared belief when it comes to the people we're trying to serve. And then the second is just the, the more logistical challenge of folks being all over the country and the world. So how to, how to help foster this kind of container for, for, for spiritual formation amongst folks who are spread out geographically. And so the architecture we've come to is, is built online, but it is an invitation for the participants to deepening uh, in their lives offline and in their everyday experience and a lot of what uh, you shared, Julie, about the, the phenomenon of, a, of an aspiration to move toward virtue and building on small groups and commitments. A lot of these same ingredients have been very present in our work on this project. But one of the, the most amazing dimensions of it has just been the work with these sisters who we've We've met with every month for uh, well over a year at this point in helping to craft this project and just to be in conversations where, you know, a young millennial who's doing some kind of, um, you know, arts based community in New York City and is just saying with all the um, sincerity they can muster, what I really want to do is just foster personal transformation in the context of community to serve the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Sister Mary turning to him and saying, my friend, this is what we call religious life. <laughs> that interplay, that conversation that yes. in so many cases is, is not happening and I think uh, many are the poorer for it. So that that's really what we're trying to animate in this project. And so we've built it on, a, a, we're, the pilot is five months into a year long 
effort and then we're going to try to see what grows from there. Um, but it begins with a question that we pose to each of the participants, which is to say, um, spiritual formation is the intentional cultivation of discipline and, and practice with one clear goal, drawing nearer to blank. <laughs> and yeah. then we give them a blank and we ask, what's on your line? And, you know, so I'm a participant in this pilot and my answer, I, I, I just used the word God. Uh, we have participants who are using the words primordial awareness. Someone is using Buddha nature. Someone is using Christ consciousness. Someone is using love. Somebody is using my higher self, right? So you have this really wide array of language and the architecture of the process moves from discernment to then cultivating the inner life. So the inner life along the lines of how do I tend blank within myself? <laughs> and then to the outer life, how do I tend blank in others? Mm -hmm. And then to the beyond, which is this question of call or perhaps someday collectively of charism, which is really to ask, you know, how how is the spirit moving me and us, and what are the gifts that are mine um, that I have inherited from that spirit to give? How how might I become ever more an instrument um, in my life? And it's that movement, you know, as we've spoken with these sisters about their movement from contemplative to apostolic, and the the true, um, you know, sometimes millennials who are uh, starved for community will somewhat romanticize how great it would be to be in community, <laughs> right? And then you have uh, one sister who I shall not name, but her <laughs> saying, you know, community, ah, it is so beautiful, and I want to bang my head against the wall, right? <laughs> like, like the reality of being up close to other human beings, <laughs> it is the greatest, and it is the most horrible, right? And so, just to be informed by um, the wisdom of, of those who have actually walked <laughs> together in that kind of intentionality has been, I think, the greatest gift of, of this pilot so far. And uh, it has been striking to me, and this is the last thing I'll say just for now, is it's been striking to me to find that coming into this work six years ago and asking you know, how in the midst of all of this transition do we steer clear of spiritual narcissism and really move toward a kind of uh, a depth of religious life in the midst of so much change that what would emerge amongst all of these young people that I've gotten to know is such a hunger for formation and such a hunger for becoming in community, this interplay of becoming and belonging that is so craved. And so to, to really have the opportunity to ask, okay, how might we be about that? And to really draw upon as much wisdom as, as we can find in service of, um, of addressing that in this current moment. It feels like an extraordinary gift to me and in my life that I get to pay attention to that question and to work on it. So the, there is more information about the work that I do just at howwegathered.org. You see how we gather on the screen. Um, and there's, there's five reports that I've co-written with, with my team about the changing religious landscape and, and the changes in both our personal experience and the cultural implications mm -hmm. of, of those changes. So more about that can, can be found there as well. Yeah, yeah, I've I've gone through a few of the documents. They are they are something. Just the quotes alone, you know, like so one of yeah. them. You know, one young adult said something like, "You know, I I finally found people I could share my vocation with." I thought this is what the church ministry leaders are dying to hear from young people, you know. And and I was like, they're doing it, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so yeah, really really profound. And and I loved I love how you're talking about. Um, you know how how the, the the sisters are getting involved and how they're sharing you know this life of of vocational commitment you know a life of discernment a life of prayer what it means to commit your life to something you know and and to be able to learn from that i mean the wisdom of the older generations you know we've, we've talked about this in other circles there's a lot of negative about generational differences that in, in popular culture, you know, in media and things like that, they say, oh, millennials are so different. Oh, technology has made us so. So there's this like, you know, implicit thinking that we're so different, we could never connect, you know, and at the base of it all, we're human. <laughs> and we've all gone through, you know, trials in our lives. We've all 
wondered what it's like to to pray more deeply or to develop spirituality or to be like some great person. You know, we all have these links, you know, we just have to kind of break those barriers down and you have provided a space for that. And that's what's what's br brilliant and beautiful about that. So so thank you so much, Angie, for that. Um, and I'm going to invite uh, Stacy and Julie, if you want to put your cameras back on, feel free. We're going to open up to some questions here. We have a few, I think, going here. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and read uh, what it is that we have. Everybody else, chime in. And, and again, if you have to leave the webinar, write your question anyhow, because we'll record it. And, and you know, just that's what one person has already done. So it was a really good idea. Um, so we had uh, somebody who had a, a quote. I think it was from when Leah was talking, you know, not a project to convert. I think that was when you're talking about evangelization. Um, so they said that they loved that. And so I thought that was neat. Um, Michael Horace uh, says, thank you, Leah. YCP has had great success in strategic urban centers. Can you offer some insights or thoughts as to how we can take the vision lessons and best practices of YCP into non-YCP city settings or how we can take them and translate them into kind of rural portions of the country? Yeah, well, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> Non-YCP city settings and rural settings. Of course, you know, it's always important to know your audience and to know who you're working with so that you can really speak to that audience and see what they really care about the most and how you can impact them. I think, you know, with our theme of working a witness for Christ, the point of that is to learn how to you know, develop our faith and develop our, our the professional side of ourselves so that we can talk to people in any kind of setting. So, you know, most of us don't work in a Catholic setting. We, you know, might not work in the city. We work in various environments. Some of us are suburban, some of us are rural, some of us are urban. So, you know, it's different, but I think with the overarching concept of, you know, do I know my faith? Do I, you know, am I passionate about my faith? Do I have this kind of attitude or mindset of dynamic orthodoxy? You know, you can really kind of speak to any audience within that. And, you know, when it comes to our name, Young Catholic Professionals and the professional part, I think, you know, if, for example, we had a YCP in a rural area, well, you know, the professions might look very different in that kind of area. And by professionals, we don't mean, you know, necessarily doctors, lawyers, business people. We mean really anyone who wants to become more of a person who's, you know, growing in their work, whatever their work may be. Even, you know, I, I like to qualify sometimes, like if you're a stay at home mom or part time employee, you know, those are work, too. So, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you're in an urban or a rural setting, you're doing some kind of work. And if you have some kind of faith, you know, that's something that you can grow in both on the work side and the faith side. So I think it's really very applicable across all different environments and all different audiences. We just have to know who we're talking to. Yeah. And like you were saying, you know, it's just the cultivation of gifts, you know, just starting with and you start off with like, I don't know if I'm going to say it right, but it was like, who do you know? Who who do you have relationships from? I think that's yeah. the start too, you know, and doesn't matter your your vicinity. Who what are the names that you can think of of young people that you can reach out to and, and build greater relationships with and then help them build their, their spiritual gifts? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, Leah. Thank you very much. Thanks. We have um, let me scroll back up here. Hang on. So Miguel, who I think had to had to leave the call, um, he said he came in about halfway into the webinar. He said, as a married young adult, I noticed that young adults groups seem different to me now that I'm in this stage of my life. I'm involved with leading a young adult group. And I was wondering, do any of you have any tips or advice for helping married young adults feel more at home in ministry outside of mentorship? Um, or do you, how do you minister to those discerning that vocation, the vocation of married guys? And, um, I look forward to your answer. He had to leave. So, so any any tips for for particularly married young adults? Uh, well, I can speak to that a little bit. So, I've been married for three and a half years, and it is a different experience. I, you know, I started getting involved with Catholic young adult groups since college. So, you know, I was involved as a single young adult, and now I'm involved as a married young adult. And we're expecting our first baby in June. And so, you know, that's going to make things even more different yeah. it, with the dynamic of the young adult group, you know, most of whom, of course, are single and don't have children. So I think, you know, uh, for me, something I'm passionate about is because I've I have many thoughts on the topic. I've had many discussions. But for me, part of it is having 
at least some passionate leaders of a young adult group who are married themselves and maybe who have children themselves because you know people learn from what they see and if we want married people to be involved and to be part of community you know and to form a community of single people and married people all together within a community then you know, we have to have kind of that diversity of life stage at the leadership level too. And so, you know, that's something personally that I really want to continue with is to be a visible leader as a married person so that, you know, I can be at least one example of saying, just because you get married doesn't mean that you're excluded now or that you don't quite fit the mold of the majority of the people now. We still want you here and we still want to be growing together because single people, and married people think differently and they have different priorities. And so we can all learn from each other. Yeah, I completely agree with um, Leah. Make sure my volume's up. I completely agree with her. I mean, I, I think young adult groups have a tendency sometimes to feel like a, a singles ministry. And so I think it's uh, just as Leah said, making sure that your leadership reflects um, all the dynamics that come with, with ministering to young adults. So even when we were coming up with our Faith is Bay series that I mentioned earlier. We had a mother there who had her two kids, you know, there um, with us who was very adamant that we have to make it was a three part series. And we had to make sure there was a series specifically focusing on family life and how do you continue to cultivate Catholic identity within your children? And then we made sure that we partnered with a deacon who has five kids as a deacon, as a professional and um, so it allowed us to connect also with um, with and those are our holy orders. So I think it's it's absolutely about you know ministry is all about accompaniment, right? And so you have to. And the reason why we have young adult ministries is because we're trying to be intentional about accompanying young adults. And to be young adult means to be in a state of flux and constant change. That is the uni to me the universal uni unifying thing. And so we can learn so much from our married young adults, even as single people, because one of the things about discerning marriage as a vocation is that we need to have honest conversations about what does it mean to be married, not in a secular sense of what society puts out there and what we see celebrities and all of those people doing, um, but also about like, what does that mean within our Catholic identity? It's great to hear your, your priest talk about the need for more marriages and the more need for more vocations, but what does that look like? Um, I recently heard, and I forget which celebrity, uh, Michelle Obama went to her book tour. She talked about this thing about like how difficult marriage is, but how rewarding it is and how it's important to have honest conversations about the fact that they had to go to, to seek counseling during their marriage. And people see them as relationship goals, but they went through difficult times and they got help and they still made it because she said the problem is that when people go through difficulties and they think that that's the breaking point because everybody else's marriage is perfect. So in a very social media driven society where people carefully curate what life looks like, it's important to have space where we have married couples who are doing well or struggling or who have kids who are literally running around during the meeting so that people say this is what it looks like, but there's still joy in it and God is still in it and you can still be called to it in your own imperfection right now. Right. I love it. I love it. And Stacy, that brings up, and I don't want to cut anybody else off because you're more than welcome to chime in, but it brings up something, not only like relationship status, but it's like parish ministry status too. Like there's some, you know, we have these conversations of like, it has to look perfect. It has to have gone wonderfully. And that, that to have done like an event or organization or whatever that like maybe didn't go as well or failed or nobody came, you know, like, that's okay. That's a part, you know, like, that's life. Things don't go great all the time. You know, marriages have struggles, you know? Yeah, and you're right. We do put up, we can definitely put up what we want people to see about us on social media. Yeah, that was that was beautifully said, Stacey. Thank you. Julie or, or Angie, do you have any thoughts on, on, on our question about, you know, married, young married couples? Um, I'm not sure I can speak to that exactly, just because our, our project does pull people. We often don't have people that come as couples to the circles in some cases, um, you know, purposefully so. Um, but I just wanted to kind of echo that point about creating spaces that, that kind of, you know, can counteract that sense of, you know, what we see on social media, what we think other people are doing, you know, how people, one of the virtues, um, in, on Franklin's list is humility, and it's always a fascinating conversation in the age of social media to talk about, um, you know, sort of the humble brag <laughs> of Instagram or the perfect meal that you've curated for your feed. Um, so I just, I really think that's that's a, a really kind of 
yeah. um, you know, no pun intended, but a virtue of these small groups is that it does get away from from some of that kind of yeah. outward curation that I, that a lot of social media encourages. Yeah, yeah, really well said. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think the only thing that I would add is just I've been um, I've been really fascinated to see and to feel within myself uh, some of the hunger for relationships with elders, specifically elders that inhabit a way of being that we ourselves might want to grow into. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's a relevant experience when it comes to these different life stages and especially the you know getting married and beginning married life and and of course this is something that often has been and still is housed within our our religious institutions to provide this kind of um, ongoing relationship in intergenerational community and even explicit mentorship and guidance about the entrance into new life stages um, and that in if if one is in the position to be in that kind of fulsome community, then that may be well and good. But uh, it seems many people are not, and so just ha like inviting a kind of call to creativity around how do we continue to foster those kind of intergenerational and eldering relationships um, when it comes to especially these big important life moments and and everything that comes after and i think i think it's being spoken to here just even in terms of you know um uh, the idea of having young adult leadership that includes singles and people who are newly married and young families and 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 then on from there um but that that more explicit uh invitation to eldering and and to uh learning from those who have gleaned wisdom about <laughs> the specific thing that you're about to enter into, I think yeah. is a piece. Like the being real about what it is to be in community. Yeah, the being real. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. help but laugh in the background. I was like, oh man, I could hear, I can hear someone saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think somebody chimed in about it too. Somebody was talking about, um, you know, romanticizing how great community will be. We have so, a comment about that. Um, because it is still a human community. We still have flaws. We still will have days where we just maybe need some alone time, you know, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael wrote that it's a great reminder that our young adult leadership should have, you know, should be varied, should be diverse, should have singles, married, um, you know, all ethnicities and cultures and races should be there as well, you know, when we think about that. Um, and then Nick has a question here. Do any of you have reactions to Christus Vivit? Uh, the new document. I sent uh, a few paragraphs to you all, and I hope it wasn't too many. But any has, has anybody been able to dive into it all, or, or chosen to, and especially the section on community have reactions to it? Some of each one of you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but maybe any other thoughts on it? I guess my my main reaction is simply, you know, it's great that we're thinking about it and that we're talking about it. And I think even the word community sometimes is used as kind of a buzzword and, you know, that has to do with the romanticization of community, you know, oh, it's it's great to have community or we have to build community, you know, sometimes it's spoken about in almost like a cliche sense. And yeah, so, like yeah, like community washing, did you call it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, just seeing that document and hearing our conversation is kind of a reminder that, yeah, we you know, we approach it in kind of like all these different approaches to basically enhancing relationships and enhancing societies and enhancing families, whether we call it community or not, you know, it's it's just really touching on how important it is really to everyone, I would say, to have quality relationship and to strive for purpose. And, you know, especially nowadays that I think people talk more and more about, you know, finding themselves and connecting themselves to you know god and to their you know bigger beliefs and finding how they can get other people in their life and join other activities in their life that will really validate who they really believe themselves to be that's wonderful i really like the line um in terms of the excerpts that you sent um it's talking about you know creating uh, a, a closely bond a closely bound community 
of all and for all, one that refuses to leave the poor and the vulnerable behind. The people wants everyone to share in the common good and thus agree to keep pace with its least members so that all can arrive together. So I know one of the questions, even in my leadership, I, I try to always ask is like, uh, kind of like who's who should be here, who's missing? Who are we failing to either reach out to or to make sure that this is um, a safe enough or welcome enough space for them? So I know we are talking about marriages. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, in, in the previous documents that the Pope Francis talking about, you know, be smelling like the sheep, right? So you can't talk about marriage and not talk about divorce. So, there, you know, there's a lot of our culture, I think, as Catholics that in, in exalting certain virtues and certain things, we also make people feel um, less valuable or abandoned sometimes when they those things don't happen to work out. <laughs> um, even being able to accompany maybe people who have considered abortion or have had an abortion. I mean, when those things kind of come up or people have fallen away from the faith because they're like, okay, I've committed this sin, it's their way back. Reconciliation right. doesn't just happen within a room with you and your priest. It also happens in the day-to-day -day interactions we have with people. So it's about meeting people, making sure that we're meeting people where they're at and we're getting into the muck of society. So one of the activities we're looking at doing is potentially hosting a um a panel around this issue about sexual assault and movement and so forth because to, especially to reach out to those with on the college campuses i mean these are conversations they are having as an attorney sometimes i get these very long winded conversations with students who are just like oh my gosh blah 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 and this is happening and what does it mean to consent what does it mean and those are opportunities to throw in theology of the body in there and, and, and talk about the dignity of the human person without necessarily saying, hi, I'm Kathleen, and today we're going to talk about sexual, you know, so it's about, you know, where are our vulnerabilities, where are the messes in our society, and are we being vocal within the context of our church and our faith and getting in the mud and the messiness that everybody is talking about but feeling like they can't talk about it within the context of their faith and yeah. how prism helps color how they live their lives. Absolutely. And and I love that you said, can we all arrive in the document? It says, can we all arrive together? It's, you know, it's, it's our job. That's what community is to bring them together, you know, and what you're saying, Stacey, reminds me of what Julie was starting off with, you know, about that deep value and meaning to go out and do something, you know, to, to be together and go out and, and create this together, you know, and, and, you know, so not only just personal transformation, but communal too, you know, and so to get back out in that community and find where those you know, I think, I think, Julie, you were talking at some point about, you know, having that space to, you know, to have those really tough questions. And that, Stacey, that's what you're, you're talking about is like, there, there are tough questions about what it means to be reconciled back to the church and, and who you are as a result and what, what sorrow and pain you've been going through as a result of that, too. And, and people do feel they don't belong anymore when, that, when, when challenging issues come up in their lives, you know, and it's, and it's our job to bring them up with us. You know, yeah, that was that was really well said, Stacey. Um, I want to give everybody, if you don't mind, and then and say whatever you like. Um, but I want to give you all your kind of like last moment, if you will. Um, we're moving into 2:30, and I'm sure some of you maybe have to get going. Some of our presenters, um, and so I definitely want to respect your time, but I also don't want to end. You know, so we have that going on for us. Um, but uh, and then we do have we do have one more question. Um, if anybody wants to tackle the question of burnout, any, you know, leaders that get burned out, especially volunteer, you know, and I wonder, Leah, if that has to do with the gifts that you identified, you know, that was coming to my mind, but I won't speak for you all, but if yeah. anybody has any thoughts about leaders that get burned out. Yeah, well, definitely in a volunteer organization, it's something that we see a lot. And I think, you know, Part of it is kind of accepting the reality that sometimes you feel that way, you feel burned out. And just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean that, you know, it's the end of the world. And so, you know, in YCP, we do take like the, the leader commitment very seriously, even though we're volunteers, it's still a commitment and we commit for a time. But we, you know, we also have a plan in place, a very, you know, good intentional plan about transitioning leaders from one year to the next. And so it's not like you're locked in forever. There's kind of this expectation that it's like year to year and you can stay on more than one year, but you know, it kind of can balance out, you know, over time as you 
go through the different seasons, you go through a lot of time, it's a lot of work, you're investing a lot, and now you can kind of start to groom somebody else to take on your role later on. And so it's, you know, for the good of the organization. And if that's really what you have in mind, that your commitment is for the good of this organization that you love, then it can become kind of easier to have that sense of, you know, even when our work is burdensome, we still give thanks to God for it because there's still a value in it. And that's part of, you know, the prayer that we always pray to our patron, St. Joseph the Worker, is, you know, when our work is pleasant and productive, well, we thank God for that. And when it's burdensome, you know, we ask God to help us see the value in that and to offer that up. And I think that's something that we've all really grown in, just, you know, the balance between being committed and, yes, being realistic with kind of how much we can handle and how much we need to ask other people for help and bring them into our positions for the next year. And I just wanted to add something quickly to that too. Um, one thing that I've noticed has been really productive, you know, the way that our circles form is that someone sort of naturally says, I'm going to start one of these. Um, mm -hmm. So they are in some ways kind of put in that host role by being the person that raises their hand. Um, but to actually once they are in that role. Um, you know, it's one thing to sort of say, oh, could I have a volunteer? Um, even people that have the best intentions don't always say, well, I didn't, I didn't see myself as a leader or I'm not great at, you know, running the conversation, so I can't volunteer for that. But to actually have structures that allow people to assume leadership roles. So one of our hosts created this um, model for her circle where they put all of the virtues in the basket with all of the sample questions. And each meeting, it's some Somebody's job to pick out the, the virtue and read the questions so they are assuming that leadership role but it's structured for them so she yeah. doesn't start the meeting and say who wants to lead it they all agreed one time you're gonna lead it and next time somebody else is gonna lead it and it kind of eases that um, sort of transition from member to leadership in a way that everybody's agreed upon um, and I think one thing that's really surprised me is that when we started a lot of people would email and say, oh, I want to join one of these, um, particularly in New York City when we were launching our first public group. And I said, well, we're actually looking for someone that might want to co-lead this with me. And a lot of people said, no, no, I'm not a leader. And one of those people actually now leads the New York City group. So I think there's a sense of, um, you know, people might not automatically see themselves in the role, but if there's a structure where they can begin to see themselves in those leadership roles, it becomes a little bit more seamless and then helps lessen the burnout on the person that was sort of the first one to raise their hands. Wonderful. Yeah, that's really, that's valuable insight. It's just cre creating the ability for somebody to learn how to lead, you know, the structures in place. That's wonderful. Yeah. Do you want me to give it all over to you for your last, for your final moments? And then we'll we'll do quick announcements and, and Paul will say his big thank you. Um, and I would also <laughs> like to point out how absolutely blessed and honored we are that you are here and that we have um, four young adult women presenting today that I think is <laughs> worth saying out loud because I'm very, very proud of it. And then we got Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Paul. But, but go ahead in whatever order you like, um, maybe, maybe the order we started in, if that makes more sense to you all. Any last thoughts that you want to give for our audience today? Um, sure, I can start. Um, I think for me, you know, this is something that has really informed my work at the Y in general. Um, but I often come back to sort of this idea of creating communities that are responsive to the people that we're creating communities for. So there's a structure um, you know, we could say, oh, we'd really love to have this club about this or, but unless it's actually engaging the people that are there, it's going to feel like a burden, um, you know, to both the organizer and to the, the people that are showing up. So one thing that I've just been really struck with about all of the examples on this call is how responsive people are mm -hmm. and to, to really sort of turn it outward and say, you know, what, how can we serve you? What do you want this to look like? And particularly with young people, I've been giving a lot of thought to that too, as we think in my role as also being kind of an arts administrator at the Y is how do we get more young people involved in the arts? It's not just by inviting them to a painting class, it's letting them come and show us what kind of art class they want to lead or what kind of programs they want to see. So I think, you know, really thinking as was mentioned, and I think it's very insightful, the idea of community gets thrown around a lot, but people are really going to be 
you know, most interest in communities that are not top down, that are very grassroots, that are built around the people that are in the room. So, so that would be my takeaway and, and something that I think everybody that spoke on this call just did a, a great job of sort of illuminating. Wonderful, thank you, Julie. Again, thank you for um, allowing me to participate on this webinar. I learned so much from our co-panelists. I was taking notes and things to take away from myself. Um, there's always an opportunity to learn. And I think, you know, I guess my parting bit of wisdom is um, just bloom where you're planted, right? So um, whether you're at a parish and it's only one or two other young adults who are interested in starting something, I think sometimes we get caught up in numbers and or as we mentioned earlier, you have successful events and all of a sudden you have a flop or you're dealing with burnout because you think, you know, a lot of that is just seated in a feeling of inadequacy, thinking that you, what you're giving is just not enough. And so I just want to affirm everyone who's thinking about either reaching out to young adults or starting a group or trying to figure out what community really is to truly live in instead of just have it being a buzzword. If God is calling you to it, he'll take you through it. Um, and he'll empower you. So um, you are enough. You are worthy because you are a child of God. And whatever he's calling to you to, you to do, he will align your paths with the right people. He will remove those obstacles to give you the strength and the wisdom to overcome it. So bloom where, you, where you're planted and your, your, your small seed could be the big mustard seed plant that then ends up giving shelter and, and hope and joy to, to other people to continue to, to grow, grow as well. So thank you again. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Go ahead, Leah. I love the word intentional. So I really want to focus on the word intentional in my closing here. And um, also, we were asked to give some advice for parish and diocesan leaders and ministry leaders. And so I kind of want to focus on that, too. So I, I really firmly believe that the more intentional we are with the way that we think and the things that we do, the more effective we are and the more happy we are overall. And so again, with this, this kind of um, big picture mindset of dynamic orthodoxy, you know, if I were to give advice to those diocesan leaders who are maybe wondering how to engage community more and really do it authentically, I would say make sure that the leaders have this mindset of dynamic orthodoxy, that they're passionate, they're purposeful, they're inspired, they see meaning in what they're doing, and they also love the truth and they have a very authentic desire to share the truth with the people that they're leading. So when they have that kind of mindset, I mean, it's naturally going to trickle down to other people and influence other people. And the more, you know, of that mindset that we all have, the more effective we're all going to be. And then second, the how. So the things that we do, again, going back to this concept of charisms and spiritual gifts, you know, if the leaders of the church used regularly tools like the called and gifted workshop and had conversations about what are your gifts? What's your discernment life like? What do you feel called to do? And discernment isn't just, you know, are you going to get married or join a religious order, but discernment on a daily basis. What do you feel called to do in your parish? What do you feel called to do at work? What do you feel called to do in your relationships? And really think about that. Then we can, you know, have those conversations and help steer people into the roles in the ministries that they will be the most effective in and they will feel the most alive in. And again, it's amazing what people will do and what people can accomplish when they feel like they're really alive in something. And so people want to say yes to, you know, that which is most meaningful. So I think the leaders just need to find what those meaningful opportunities are for people, help them to do that and give them the opportunity to say yes. And they will. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Leah. Go ahead, Angie. Great. Thank you again, everyone. I think what young, ad what young adults need most at this moment is to really see Jesus living again in the lives of the people around them who reveal the gospel by virtue of their way of being in the world. And I think this is a call to each one of us to love and creativity and courage and growth toward God. I think our culture is crying out to be spiritually baptized and illuminated with a new understanding and and use of the gospel in the moment we find ourselves in and, and that it falls to each one of us to foster the connection to God that enables us to be instruments of that spirit and, and therefore to provide through our very way of being an invitation to the generations that will come up behind us uh, and that the more we discover 
the presence of God in our own experience, the more we become just these overflowing sources of inspiration and soulful living to young adults. So my, my question really for our leaders is, what does it look like to go forward from where we find ourselves? If we're truly to serve these young people, how might we be attentive to the ancient wisdom that's ours to draw upon, as well as courageous enough to leave behind what no longer serves and grasps what is new and of spirit? And I think that is the difficult and important question to hold and bravely live into both personally and then as a group. Yeah, what can we cultivate from tradition and what, what should we let go of? Yeah, I mean, and it sounds like, you know, when, when you were saying like, you know, go out and be the gospel, it's like, be church, don't just go to church, be church, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love that, I love that, Angie. Thank you so much. Paul, any thoughts? Do you wanna, I'm gonna turn it over to you real quick. We have announcements, you can say whatever you like. <laughs> Um, well, first, I just want to offer my thanks from the from the Bishop's Conference perspective. Um, uh, first of all, just to acknowledge what Tracy said earlier, um, I appreciate that um, over an hour and 40 some minutes went by before you heard a male voice. And um, uh, I think uh, today that's um, that's great. I even tried to beg out of even saying anything at all. But, but, I was like, just come on and say thank you. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I am here to do. Um, uh, so I want to echo Pope Francis um, that the this exhortation that came out, the the seventh chapter um, for many of us who engage in ministry and, and, and engage in interaction with with uh, young people uh, has been very prominent, and in it Pope Francis really talks about the fact that um, our pastoral programs and our communities um, have been significantly affected by our cultural changes. Um, but that we do need to start working together, communicate with each other. And so I think just seeing your faces here, um, we are communicating. And I think whether it's inside, outside the church, it, you know, in, in, you know, in our parishes, in our communities, somehow, you know, building this network together is a beautiful thing. So I just thank you for also being listening to each other. I like the fact that you were taking notes for each other, um, listening to each other, which is, you know, um, not there's not one silver bullet, but yet there are many wonderful, um, many wonderful flowers that are out there that we can discover in different types of. I'm using analogies over back and forth, so I apologize. Bullets and flowers, it just yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, what can I say? Um, but uh, but I am just grateful because I think what you're also challenging us to do is to think beyond where we've been thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, the Holy Father was very keen to say that sometimes we've failed or we've fallen short of our goal to really reach everyone that we could reach. And you're giving us creative strategies of how to think beyond what we've always done. And so um, I want to thank all of you in your unique ways um, that you've brought people together and brought young adults together. And we can learn from you. I can I, I have learned so much from what all of you have said today. Um, and, uh, and I just want to keep that culture of humbly learning from each other. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your presence. And, uh, and again, just on behalf of the Bishop's Conference, we're just grateful that you're able to challenge us as a church. So thank you so much. And that's all you're going to hear from me. I echo that. Um, I'll make quick announcements and, and then we'll, we'll sign off. Um, our next webinar, for those that are still on, is, is May 2nd at 2 p.m. The two, we're missing a 2 in there, but it is May 2nd. Um, and we are going to start cracking open that papal exhortation. And then our next one, we're going to have kind of a two-part series. Um, and it's really going to be, it's going to be May 2nd and then um, May 23rd is our is our next one. So two-part series of, of what is the exhortation, what's in there, and then how are we bringing that alive? And this is really going to be like audience, very much audience-based. You know, it's, it's we want to hear from you. How are you bringing the exhortation alive? So, so you've got till the middle of May to tell us. Um, <laughs> and so we welcome all of that. And I also really thought this is an excellent time. We have an opening here at Loyola University in New Orleans, and, and we're so super excited about it because this is a ministry position. It's a campus ministry internship position. Um, it's a three-year position. You have free room and board and um, a graduate degree <laughs> at, at, when you're finished, you know, um, at the Loyal Institute for Ministry. So it's a really wonderful opportunity. Um, feel free to email me for the link. I, I don't think I have it with me to, uh, to put up right now. And so finally, you know, I, I want to thank all of our presenters, Julie, Stacy, Leah, and Angie. I can't, we are so grateful for your insights and for your time today. And this was, we went longer than I had 
anticipated and I apologize. Um, but it was so valuable and I'm so grateful to all of you. And so on behalf of the Loyal Institute for Ministry, I am just so grateful for all of your work in ministry and for your voices and your courage and your ambition and drive to keep going when the obstacles are there, you know, and to keep sharing this wisdom and to keep mentoring the next generation of young leaders. So, so I thank you all so very much. Um, and I, I'm very happy to give out your emails. You, you, several of you put them in the chat bar. So when I give the link to everyone, I'll put your contact information if, if you want me to share it. So, so thank you again. Thank you all so much. All right. Bye, guys. Have a wonderful day.